revised edition of the first volume in our Irish Railway series provides a useful introduction to Ireland's railway heritage as it was recorded by a number of filmmakers from the 1950s onwards. In this programme we will travel from Belfast and Larne in the northeast to Baltimore in the southwest and see steam, diesel, electric and horse traction at work. To the original films made over a 30 year period by Harry Luff, we have added new and previously unpublished archive material filmed by John Laird and Edwin Wilmshurst. Trains will be seen in action on both the Irish standard gauge of 5 foot 3 and on the country's once extensive network of 3 foot narrow gauge railways. We begin with a look at railways in and around Belfast, starting at York Road Station the headquarters of the system formerly run by the Northern Counties Committee of the London, Midland and Scottish Railway. From the late 1940s onwards, the NCC lines were under the control of the Ulster Transport Authority. V-Class 060, number 13, seen shunting at York Road, was the last survivor of three locomotives built at Derby in 1923. Sister locos numbers 14 and 15 were withdrawn in 1961. Number 13 lasted until 1964. By the time these films were made by John Laird and Harry Luff, number 13 was confined to shunting duties at York Road and trip freights over dock lines in the city to the Maysfield Goods Yard. The influence of Derby Works can be seen in the last new steam locomotives delivered to the NCC, the WT Class 264 tanks. We shall see more of these locos later in the programme. Rail car number one, seen arriving at York Road Station, was built by the NCC in 1933. Originally powered by two Leyland petrol engines, these were later replaced by diesel ones. A set of the UTA's multiple purpose rail cars arrives at York Road. Built in the late 1950s, as can be seen in the second volume of this series, The Swan Song of Steam and Ulster, they were also able to haul goods trains. These multi engine diesel rail cars were put in service in the early 1950s by the UTA. They had automatic sliding doors controlled by the guard. The first three miles of the NCC main line out from York Road, running along the shore of Belfast Lock, were level. From White House, the line began the climb, which took it up some 340 feet in the six miles between White House and Kingsbog Junction. Heavy trains were often double headed and would race along the lock shore to gain momentum for the bank ahead. By the time trains reached White Abbey Station, just over four miles out from York Road, they were climbing hard, as is evident from this sight of a WT tank with a nine coach load. The UTA's prototype 1951 built AAC rail cars numbers six and seven arrive at White Abbey on an upstopping train. Three of these odd looking rail cars were built in the 1930s. The elevated driving position was to enable the driver to see ahead when the rail car was propelling a trailer. Two multiple engine diesel units with two trailers form the next service. Built at Derby in 1935, W-class mogul number 91, the Bush, pounds up the bank. The WT class tanks, one of which is hauling the next down service, were really a tank engine version of the Moguls. We next have another view of the rail car with the lookout. It has run round its trailer in Belfast. The practice of propelling trailers was abandoned after an accident early in their careers. The sequence at White Abbey ends with this shot of a WT hauled up passenger train with some vacuum braked container wagons used to carry bread at the rear of the train. The line to Larne diverged from the NCC main line to London Derry at Bleach Green Junction, just beyond White Abbey Station. This cab ride from York Road to Larne was filmed on WT Class 264 tank number 10, built at Derby in 1947. The train passes through White Abbey Station. The concrete viaducts which formed the flying junction at Bleach Green were built in the early 1930s.
Beyond Carrickfergus, the Larne Line skirts the shore for most of the rest of the way. The route is double track as far as Whitehead and single with passing loops from there to Larne, hence the need to collect a token at Whitehead station. The train leaves Whitehead, which has long been the main base of the Railway Preservation Society of Ireland, and soon it covers the 10 miles or so to Larne Harbour. When Northern Ireland Railways was formed in 1968, it took over 22 steam locomotives from the UTA. These were used mainly on a contract which the railways had won to move quarry spoil from Machramorn between Whitehead and Larne to the shoreline of Belfast Loch, just outside York Road Station. The spoil was used to reclaim the land on which the M2 motorway was later built. The remaining WTs or jeeps, as they were affectionately known to both railway men and enthusiasts, were used on these trains. Along with the handful of ex Great Western pannier tanks used on engineering trains by London Transport, these locos in Ulster were the last steam locomotives in regular railway company service in the British Isles. This sequence of the WTs on spoil trains was filmed in 1969 by Wilf Waters. WT number six moves off the shed at York Road before a hard day's work on the spoil trains. The normal method of working these trains was to have an engine at each end of a rake of wagons, which had been specially built for this contract by Cravens. They had hydraulically operated side doors. An empty spoil train heads towards the quarry at Machramorn. One loco takes water, whilst the other shunts the train. Jeep number four, seen here, on withdrawal by Northern Ireland Railways in 1971, was preserved by the Railway Preservation Society of Ireland. The loading completed, a heavy spoil train leaves the quarry and heads towards the main line and back to Belfast. The spoil train is recorded on the coastal section between Whitehead and Carrickfergus. Although regular steam working on passenger trains had ended, on this occasion a jeep has been pressed into service to haul a failed railcar set. 
Between November 1966 and May 1970, over 7,600 spoil trains were operated by at first the UTA and latterly by Northern Ireland Railways. Some of the tank engines used on the trains were fitted with extended coal bunkers. The most common formation was a wake of 20 wagons with a loco front and rear, and this made for a train of over 900 tonnes in weight. On their way to Belfast, the spoil trains had to climb the four and a half miles of Green Island Bank, which had a ruling gradient of 1 in 98. The sound of two jeeps hard at work on the bank will long be remembered by those who experienced it. The age of steam on Ireland's railways certainly ended in a most spectacular fashion on these workings. One other type of steam locomotive survived until almost the end of steam workings in Northern Ireland. On the closure in 1957 of the Sligo Leet from the Northern Counties Railway, a line we will see later in the programme, that company's last two new locomotives, a pair of Bear Peacock built 064 tanks dating from 1949, were acquired by the UTA. Number 27 by its new owners but retaining its name Loch Erne. This local was not withdrawn until 1970. On the 23rd of March 1968, Number 27 worked a Railway Preservation Society of Ireland special from York Road to Larne Harbour. The tank was subsequently preserved and is now in the care of the society whose rail tour it was working that day. When the special arrived back in Belfast, participants were taken in open wagons on a tour of dock lines, hauled by the RPSI's Hudswell Clark built 040 tank number 3, which had spent its working life at Guinness's Brewery in Dublin. Our final views on the Larne Line were taken in the late 1960s. By now the rail cars are in Northern Ireland Railway's new livery, a big improvement on the UTA's drab dark green. On the Larne Line, multiple purpose diesels are operating most of the services. At Carrick Fergus, a set of the then new 70 class rail cars raced through the station non stop, forming a boat train from Lawn Harbour. These are followed by a pair of MPDs hauling a rake of the distinctive vacuum braked brown vans often seen on NCC section workings. Up to the mid 1970s, Belfast still had three railway termini, York Road, which we have seen, Queen's Quay and Great Victoria Street. This is the approach to Queen's Quay Station, which served the erstwhile Belfast and County Down railway system. Most of the BCDR was closed shortly after it was taken over by the UTA, with only the busy double-track suburban line to Bangor surviving the slaughter. In 1954, the Bangor Line became the first route in the British Isles to be completely dieselised, with all Bangor Line services being worked by the multiple engine diesels seen in these pictures. A short distance from Queen's Quay, on the Belfast Central Line, which linked the BCDR to the Great Northern System, lay Maysfield's Goodyard, where a GNR 060 and an RT class 062 tank bearing its UTA number 24 are seen chanting. It was on this site beside the River Lagan that Belfast Central Station was built in the 1970s.
Belfast's third terminus was that of the Great Northern Railway at Great Victoria Street. 442 Tank No. 5 shunts at the station in this sequence made by John Laird in 1963. Built to Glover's design in 1921 by Bayer Peacock, No. 5 was one of the last members of what had been the GNR's most numerous class to remain in service, being withdrawn in 1964. When the Great Northern Railway Board was disbanded, its assets were equally divided between the UTA and Corus Imperarum, which ran the railways in the Irish Republic. The UTA repainted most of their share of the blue GNR locos black. However, CIE retained the beautiful GNR blue on their ex Great Northern engines. When the UTA bought several of these back from CIE in 1963 to cope with the temporary shortage of motive power, the Great Northern Sky Blue livery returned to its Belfast terminus. Great Victoria Street Station, right in the centre of Belfast, closed in the 1970s, when services were concentrated on the new Belfast Central Station, built on the site of the former Gurjard at Maysfield, which we saw earlier in the programme. However, wiser councils have subsequently prevailed, and in 1995, Northern Ireland Railways opened a new station at Great Victoria Street. Once again, commuters into Belfast can use a station right in the heart of the city centre. Appropriately, the first steam locomotive to use a new station was Great Northern V-Class Compound 440, No. 85 Merlin, which is in the care of the Railway Preservation Society of Ireland. The first station out from Great Victoria Street was at Adelaide. The Great Northern engine shed was also located here. An ex-NCC W-Class 260 Mughal brings a goods train past Adelaide destined for the Crofton Road Goods Yard in Belfast. GNR S-Class 440, number 190 Lugnaquilla, renumbered 62 by the UTA, hurries through Adelaide Station. WT-Class 264 tank, number 54, heads south on a train of CIE stock. AEC railcars, number 6 and 7, which we saw earlier at White Abbey, now running as a two-coach unit, pause at the station. From Gora Wood, 40 miles south of Belfast, a 10-mile long branch struck off towards Newry and Warren Point. This picturesque line was closed in 1965 and was a particular favourite of John Laird, who filmed these scenes on the route between Nora Watercastle and Warren Point in the two years before the line closed. On a wintry day, GNR SG Class 060 No. 176, renumbered 44 by the UTA, heads towards Warren Point. Earlier in the day, John Laird had recorded this locomotive being turned at Warren Point Station. Built in 1913 by Bayer Peacock, this design is typical of the GNR practice of building an 060 goods engine which used the boiler and all the components of contemporary passenger 440 designs. The SG class was a goods variant of the S class 440s, which we have seen earlier. The Jeeps were originally barred from this route on the grounds that they were too heavy. But towards the end, no one cared and the road was relaxed. Number 55 is being turned at Warren Point Station. Day trippers to the seaside at Warren Point made the line very busy on summer Sundays and bank holidays with excursion traffic. A jeep leaves the terminus to head back to Belfast in the last summer in which the line was open. Other sequences filmed on this picturesque route appear on volumes 2 and 4 
of this Irish Railway series. The long branch from Drogheda on the main Belfast to Dublin line to Old Castle was worked for many years by that most uniquely Irish of railway vehicles, a rail bus. This example was built by the Great Northern for the Sligo Leitrim and Northern Counties Railway. The rail buses combined a flanged railway wheel and a rubber tyre. The Great Northern rail bus used in the Old Castle branch service arrives at Drogheda. At Old Castle, the rail bus, which could only be driven from one end, was off to turn. Additional film of rail buses at work on this line can be seen on Volume 5 of this series, Irish Railways in the 1940s and 50s. The terminus of the Great Northern Main Line in Dublin was at Amin Street. A train of BUT rail cars arrive, forming the crack service on the line, the Enterprise Express from Belfast. This sequence was shot in 1957. As in our scenes at the Belfast end of the line earlier in the programme, a Glefer 442 tank is on station pilot duty. Compound at number 85, Merlin, which we saw on a rail tour at the reopened Great Victoria Street station in Belfast, is here backing onto a Belfast train at Amiens Street. Two CIE J15 060s pass through on the lines leading from Westland Row Station. And a GNR articulated rail car arrives on a service from Hoth. The Great Northern had an extensive network of secondary lines in Mid Ulster of which Cavan was the most southerly point. The town was also reached by a branch of the former Midland Great Western system, which stripped north from any junction near Mullingar. Railcar C1, arriving at Cavan on a service from Clonus, was built in 1934. It is hauling one of the light trailers used for luggage and parcels, so light, in fact, that it can be manually shunted while the unit goes to the turntable. The railcar's 96 horsepower Gardner diesel engine is in the front driving compartment which is articulated from the passenger saloon. Like the rail bus seen earlier, the vehicle can be driven from one end only and has to be turned before it can return to Clonus. A goods train hauled by a new CIE C-Class diesel, number C208, arrives at Cavan from the south on the former Midland Great Western line. The next GNR working from Clonus brings one of the elderly P-Class 440s to Cavan station. Six and a half miles north of Cavan, was Ballyhays, junction for the GNR's Bell Turbot branch. A JT class 242 tank, number 91, brings a train of coal from the mines at Arigna off the branch and provides an introduction to the first of the Norgays lines covered in this programme. The Cavan and Leitrim Railway, which opened in the 1880s, ran south from Bell Turbot to Drummond on the main Dublin to Sligo line. From Ballinamore, a branch went off to Arigna where one of the few workable deposits of coal in Ireland was to be found. Arigna's poor quality coal was the main reason the line survived as long as it did, finally closing in March 1959. By the late 1950s, there was just one train which conveyed passengers on the northern section of the Cavan and Leitrim. This working arrives at Belturbet, hauled by former Cork Blackrock and Passage 242 tank, number 10. Having run round its train and visited the turntable, the locomotive heads the return working back to Ballinamore.
at Ballyconnell, six miles west of Belturbet. On another occasion, the passenger working is shunted to allow a coal train to pass. This is hauled by number three, one of the former Trillian Dingle 260 tanks, which ended their days on the Cavan and Leitrim. engines with their driving wheels four foot six inches in diameter, the largest of any supplied to an Irish narrow gauge line, were restricted to the bell turbot to drummit section. Ballinamore was the headquarters of the railway and the junction of the branch to Arigna. Locomotives were shedded and maintained here. The Cork Black Rock and Passage engines were sent north following the closure of their own line in 1932. Both the locomotive on this working arriving from Drummond and the passenger carriage on the train came from the Tralee and Dingle line in County Kerry which closed in 1953 and is featured in volume 3 of this series. This local Trillian and Dingle 260 tank number 6, seen leaving Ballinamore on a coal train, was sent to the Cavan and Leitrim by CIE as late as 1957 to cope with an upsurge in coal traffic at the time. Some of the railway's original 440 tank locomotives dating from the 1880s were still in service up to closure. The branch to Arigna left the Drummond to Belturbet line at Ballinamore. With the two single lines leaving the station, the one on the right leads to Drummond. The other, and the train upon it, is for Arigna. The Arigna line was always known as the tramway. It ran along the roadside for much of its route. The locomotive on this train, number four, originally named Violet, was built by Robert Stevenson in 1887 for the Cavan and Leitrim Railway. When the line closed in 1959, two of these locomotives survived. Number three was shipped to America and number two was preserved in Belfast Transport Museum and can now be seen at the Ulster Folk and Transport Museum at Coltraw, just outside Belfast. The train pauses at Kilturbrid. The brake fan and the distinctive coach with the verandas behind the locomotive are also original Calvin and Leitrim stock. Drumshambo was the only village of any size on the tramway. Number four and her train cautiously negotiate one of the number of ungated level crossings which were to be found on the tramway. The mixed train has left a few vans at Drumshambo. Only the brake van, coach and a few empty coal wagons remain to be taken on to Arigna. It was coal from the mines at Drinavogi beyond Dorigna, which allowed the Cavan and Leitrim section of CIE to survive until the end of the 1950s. The four mile extension up to the mines was opened as late as 1920, the work being funded by the British government as part of a drive to increase Irish coal production during the Great War. Passenger trains only ever ran as far as Arigna. Beyond there, the line was used by coal trains only. Number four is turned for the journey back to Ballinamore.
one of the Tralee and Dingle engines are seen at Regna on another occasion. And a Cavan and Leitrim 440 tank heads up to the mines. Our final scenes at Regna feature 440 tank number 8, which was originally named Queen Victoria. Back now to the Cavan and Leitrim's main line for these scenes on the southern section between Ballinamore and Drummond. Number 10, one of the cork engines is shunting at Mohill. Cavan and Leitrim trains were mixed, conveying both goods and passenger traffic, and this meant that station stops could be prolonged as wagons were detached from or added to trains. Trimmed was the southern terminus of the line, where it met the former Midland Great Western route from Dublin to Sligo. As number 10 makes up its train in the sidings there prior to departure, it is worth mentioning that today Drummond once again echoes to the sound of a steam locomotive at work. The Norwegian station and the engine shed there have been restored to their former glory by the new Cavan and Leitrim Railway Company, a band of doughty railway builders who have also secured the station at Mohill as a possible northern terminus for the new line. Track is being laid up to the first level crossing at Cloncullery and train rides are available for visitors to the station. The next part of the programme concerns another remarkable railway which survived into the 1950s, the sligo Leitrim and Northern Counties line. Running from Sligo to Inniskillen, it became the last surviving independent standard gauge railway in the British Isles. Its goods trains were hauled up until the line was forced to close in 1957 by a fleet of 064 tank locomotives which were never given numbers, they were always known by name only. How that would baffle one of today's accountant dominated railways. Our coverage of the line begins at Sligo. Passenger services were normally in the hands of a rail bus and a rail car. Rail car B, built in 1947 by Walkers of Wigan, was in effect a broad gauge version of the rail car supplied by that firm to the County Donegal Norwich gauge lines from the 1930s onwards, which we will see later in the programme. Railbus 2A, built by the Great Northern at Dundalk Works for the SLNCR, leaves Drumahair. Manor Hamilton was the location of the railway's headquarters, and here Railcar B is seen again. A major part of the line's goods traffic was in cattle. Sir Henry, shunting a goods train at Manor Hamilton, was one of the railway's fleet of 064 tanks built by Bayer Peacock in Manchester. Sir Henry dated from 1904. At Belcou, the line crossed into Northern Ireland, and here trains were subjected to examination by Her Majesty's Customs and Excise. Killyhaven Viaduct near Inniskillen was the only significant engineering feature on the route. Sir Henry shunts some cattle wagons at Inniskillen. It was the arbitrary closure at the insistence of the Government of Northern Ireland in 1957 of the GNR lines through Inniskillen which robbed the SLNCR of an outlet for its traffic and led to its closure. From Inniskillen, Great Northern Lines radiated west to the Atlantic coast at Bundoran, north to Oma, Straban and Derry, and east to Clonas, a major junction with lines to Belfast and Dock, and the one we saw earlier to Cavan. A train headed by PP Class 440 number 106 arrives at Clonas from the Inniskillen direction.
the local was later seen in the station with an SG3 class 060 alongside. Another elderly 440 arrives at Clonus. Back at Inniskillen, a set of the Great Northern's AEC railcars enters the station from the Clonus direction. Harry Luff now headed north to record one of the great attractions for enthusiasts visiting Ireland in the 1950s. U Class 440 number 204 Antrim, built by Bear Peacock in 1948, arrives at Fintna Junction with the train from Oma. When the London Dairy and Inniskillen Railway was constructing this route in the 1850s, lack of money caused the railway to suspend work temporarily with the line terminating at the small village of Fintna in County Tyrone. When construction resumed, it was from a point three quarters of a mile away from the village, at what was to become Fintana Junction. Permission was obtained from the Board of Trade to work the short branch from the junction to the village by horsepower. It continued to be operated in this fashion for just over a hundred years until the line closed in 1957. The motive power for the branch over the years was a succession of geldings called Dick. The tram car offered accommodation for all three classes of passengers. Third class ticket holders were consigned to the top deck, open to the elements. The lower saloon was divided into separate compartments for first and second class passengers. Dick had an aversion to noisy steam locomotives and had to be put into a shed at the junction before the connecting service arrived. At Oma, the line from Inniskillen joined the Great Northern Route from Belfast to Derry. A train from Derry arrives at Oma Station, hauled by S-Class 440 number 171 Sleeve Gullion, the only survivor of this most elegant class, now in the safe hands of the RPSI. Another S-Class is seen in this line at Straban. Here number 192 Sleeve Naman has the assistance of a banker to get her heavy train out of the station. From here the line climbs steadily for over 30 miles to breast the watershed of the Sperrin Mountains at a summit between Carrickmoor and Pomroy. Great Northern rail cars arrive at Straban. Harry Luff had come to Straban to film the County Donegal Nargate system. At its peak, the CDR operated over 124 route miles of three-foot gauge track. Jointly owned after 1906 by the Great Northern and the English Midland Railway, the distinctive red and cream livery of the Donegal was a great attraction for railway enthusiasts. A regular sight which greeted visitors to Straban for many years was that of the CDR's only diesel locomotive, number 11 Phoenix, shunting at the station. Scheduled passenger services were worked by a fleet of diesel rail cars one of which is seen here leaving Straban on a service to Stranorlar. But the railway retained a number of steam locomotives for goods and excursion traffic. One of the three Class 5 264 tanks, which lasted until the system closed, and all of which were subsequently preserved, is seen shunting goods stock at Straban. The last pair of rail cars, numbers 19 and 20, have also survived, this time on the Isle of Man. The rail cars often towed a van or a wagon to carry parcels or passengers' luggage. Stranorder was the site of the line's administrative headquarters and its workshops. Hauling one of the lightweight red liveried vans designed to work with them, a rail car approaches Loch Esk between Stranora and Donegal Town. A 264 tank hurries a coal train along. CDR wagons were fully fitted with vacuum brakes. The brake coach at the rear of Donegal goods trains was to accommodate the guard. At Donegal Town, the line from Straban through Stranora divided, with branches going to Ballyshannon and Killy Beggs. Today, Donegal Town Station has been turned into a splendid heritage centre by the County Donegal Railway Restoration Society 
and is well worth a visit. Here real car number 18, now restored to working order at the Foyle Valley Railway in Derry, arrives at the station off the Killy Beggs branch. This real car is bound for Ballyshannon. Of the two single lines leading out of the station, the one on the left leads to Ballyshannon, that on the right to Stranorra. The 15 and a half mile long branch from Donegal Town to Ballyshannon opened in 1905. The final part of the CDR system, the Straban and Letterkenny Railway, opened on New Year's Day 1909. A heavy goods train from Letterkenny arrives at Straban. Lifford, just across the river from Straban, was the first station in County Donegal, and after the partition of Ireland, the first station in the Irish Free State. The last new rail car, number 20, is seen at work on the Letterkenny line. A rail car leaves the CDR station at Letterkenny, a town also served by Donegal's other Norrigate system, the London Derry and Luxville Railway, which is covered in volumes 3 and 5 of this series. The rest of this programme will concentrate on the railways run by CIE in the Republic of Ireland, beginning with some of the lines in and around Dublin. Our first stop is Westland Row known today as Pierce Station. This had been the home of the Dublin and South Eastern Railway, which, like the other lines in the South, had been grouped to form the Great Southern in 1925, the latter giving way to CIE in 1945. The variety of trains filmed by Harry Luff at Westland Row is typical of that mixture of the latest diesels running alongside vintage locomotives and carriages of the steam era, which made the railways of CIE so fascinating in the 1950s. An 062 tank brings a suburban train in from the direction of Bray. The Black Dodge saloons coming up the ramp into the station were used as taxis in Dublin at this time. A former Midland Great Western 060 tank brings a varied collection of vintage parcels and fitted vans through the station. The next northbound service produces Metropolitan Vickers Coco Diesel A34, barely a year old. The new diesel is followed by an over 50 year old Great Southern and Western 440. In the 1950s, as today, the line south along the coast through Dunleary to Bray was busy with suburban traffic. A J15 060 arrives at Dunleary with a train mostly made up of new coaches in their original stainless steel livery. Another of the Great Southern built 062 tanks, which spent much of their careers on these suburban services, has the next northbound train. Heading further south, the line comes to Bray, the terminus of many of the suburban services from the city. Up to 1958, Bray commuters had the choice of two routes into Dublin. And that year, the line from Shangana Junction to Harcourt Street Station was closed, but part of its formation will be used for a new breed of super trams before the end of the 1990s. Back in the 1950s, a J15A arrives at Bray. This local was afterwards seen beside another member of the Scrit Southern class. Our final sequence at Bray shows a J15 arriving at the station. The surviving line from Bray to the city was electrified in the 1980s and the smart green electric dart units provide a much more frequent service than ever before. One of these trains is seen here arriving at Kalini. The third major Dublin station visited by Harry Luff was Kingsbridge, known today as Euston, 
the terminus of what had been Ireland's largest railway, the Great Southern and Western, whose line served much of the south of the country. The next Great Southern and Western D11 class 440 is acting as station pilot. These distinctive rail cars were designed by O.V. Bullied during his tenure as Chief Mechanical Engineer of CIE. A34, which we saw earlier at Westland Row, leaves on a train for the south. Kingsbridge is close to Guinness's brewery at St James's Gate. A substantial traffic in one of Ireland's favourite beverages was conveyed by Guinness's own locomotives between the brewery and the station. One of their Hudswell Clark built saddle tanks brings a train of empty wagons out of the station yard. Hudswell Clark Diesel No. 4 heads for the station with loaded wagons. The brewery had an extensive internal narrow gauge system. To enable narrow gauge locos to work broad gauge traffic, they could be lowered by crane into these broad gauge wagons their wheels applying traction for those of the wagon by means of special gearing. CIE made just one experiment with the rail bus concept, which had proved successful in the north, in the form of this former Dublin United Tramway Company, AC Regal. It is seen here at Clonmel when it was at work on the line between there and Thurles. Still at Clonmel, a J15 passes through the station on a goods train bound for Limerick Junction. CIE's main lines were dieselised with astonishing rapidity. By 1960, steam had all but disappeared from scheduled goods and passenger services, though the last steam locos were not officially withdrawn until 1963. One line which remained largely steamworked into the 1960s was the former Midland Great Western branch in County Galway from a time and junction on the main Dublin to Galway line west of Athlone to Loch Ray, which Edmund Wilmshurst visited in June 1962. The locomotive on the mixed branch train at a time and junction was G2 class 240, number 654. The nine mile branch was opened in 1890 and closed in 1975. The unusual diesel power which replaced steam locomotives on its trains can be seen in Volume 7 of the series, Irish Railways in the 1960s. At Loch Ray, the locomotive goes off to turn. The G2s were the last 240 tender engines in service in the British Isles. Number 654 was built at Broughton in Dublin in 1890 by the Midland Great Western, who numbered it 28 and gave it the name Clara. One of only a handful of steam locomotives which remained on the books of CIE by this time, Sadly, no example of this class escaped the scrap van. Number 654 was withdrawn later in 1962. CIE's other remaining three foot gauge line in the 1950s was a very different affair to the steam traction and vintage rolling stock we have seen on the Cavan and Leitrim. As Leo Curran, son of the County Donegal Railway's general manager B.L. Curran, was responsible for the dieselisation of the West Clare line, which was completed by 1955, it is not surprising that the rail cars and locomotives were based on designs developed, tried, and tested for many years on the County Donegal system. Our programme ends with films made on the railways of County Cork. We begin at Glanmire Road in Cork City, where trains from Dublin terminated. We then follow the connecting line through the city streets to the terminus of the now closed lines which served West Cork, once owned by the Cork, Bandon and South Coast Railway. At Glanmire Road, ex Midland Great Western 060 tank number 552 passes the camera. Silver Diesel B109 in faded silver livery and abandoned 460 tank are seen together in the yard. A tenuous link was maintained between Cork's two main stations by the grandly named Cork City Railway, which was really a tramway running through the city streets. It was used for goods and stock transfer trains but not passenger workings. Here a set of rail cars heads towards Glanmire Road. 
H. A. Ivett, later famed for his expressed locos for the English Great Northern, cut his teeth as a locomotive designer at Inchicore. J11 class 060 tank number 217 was built to his 1887 design at Inchicore in 1901. Is hauling a transfer freight out of Glanmire Road towards Albert Quay. Heading in the opposite direction on another occasion is number 470, one of the successful class of 460 tanks built by Bayer Peacock for the Cork, Bandon and South Coast Railway between 1906 and 1920. Number 470, built in 1912, was the last of the class to retain her original round-topped boiler. Another Ivet design, an F6 class 242 tank dating from the 1890s, shunts some stock under the unusual elevated signal box at Albert Quay, the station which served the west of County Cork. J30 060 tank number 90 is another local recorded by Harry Luff which was subsequently preserved. Early dieselisation did not save the lines in West Cork. The light C-class 550 horsepower diesels were introduced in 1956. The rail cars used in many passenger services had come in a few years earlier. These views of the line through Bandon Station were taken from the cab of a C-class diesel on a goods train. Clonakilty Junction, the mixed branch train for Clonakilty is in the hands of another C-class, number 227, in the later green livery. Near Clonakilty, the train pauses to detach a couple of wagons for the Shannon Vale Mill Tramway. This line, which served a flour mill, was West Cork's answer to the Fintner branch in the north. The motive power here was called Paddy. Ballinus Scarthy on the Clonakilty line was the junction for another branch, which began life as the independent Timaleg and Court McSherry Light Railway. Opened in 1891, for part of its route it was that rarity, a broad gauge roadside tramway. The line remained open until 1961. It carried excursionists in summer to the seaside at Court McSherry and in the winter months, it was busy with sugar beet traffic. C220 ventures down towards Court McSherry, the goods train consisting of just one wagon, a scene guaranteed to give an accountant a coronary. The train is shunted by gravity at Court McSherry. Back at Clonakilty Junction on the main line, we have a few scenes taken between here and Baltimore, the most southerly point on Ireland's railway network. Skibbereen was once the junction with a Skull and Skibbereen Norwegian line, which finally closed in the late 1940s. The train slows down for Cray Station some 58 miles from Albert Quay. On the final stretch towards Baltimore, it is worth reflecting that we have come a long way in the course of this railway odyssey. From Larne in the northeast to this southwestern outpost, the distance by rail is in the region of some 370 miles. Harry Luff continued to visit Ireland throughout the 1960s and 70s. 
These scenes were filmed at the Curra in the late 1960s, when expresses on the Cork main line were in the hands of pairs of General Motors 141 class diesels. GM diesels now completely dominate the Irish railway scene both north and south of the border. The first part of this friendly American invasion was in the form of the single cab 121 class diesels delivered in 1961. One of these, B129, brings a train from Rosslare into Greystones. We hope to devote a later programme in this series to the diesels of the period, which are also covered in Volume 7, Irish Railways in the 1960s.